Hello and welcome back, and that is right. Today I want to talk about the very best SSD NAS that you can buy at the end of 2023. There are a lot of NAS solutions out there, hundreds if not thousands, just over the last 10 years or so. But it's only been within the last 18 months or so that we've seen this shift towards prosumer and home level access to flash NAS. NAS systems that are optimized specifically towards the use of solid state drives rather than mechanical hard drives. And in this video, I'm going to be going through several different solutions for home, for business, and for some in the middle that are the best SSD NAS solutions out there in the market right now. But before we go any further, I've got to go through a few disclaimers because some users won't really understand the importance of making the jump over to SSD optimized NAS solutions or may find out that they don't even need a NAS optimized towards SSDs and find themselves saving a little bit of bumps there. So if you've only come to this video to know the recommendations for home business and everything in the middle there should be chapters at the bottom of the screen where you can jump ahead to that but for the rest of you i do think it's worth going through just a few little details throughout and the first one is all the solutions in this video are going to be turnkey solutions. We're not going to talk about any solution that doesn't arrive as a combined hardware and software solution. The reason being that although you can go out and get tremendous savings, DIYing your own NAS with Unraid or rocking around with true NAS, things like the top tin here that arrives with either a Celeron or Pentium processor that's got two M2 NVMe bays on it, and they've got upgraded ones like the one we're talking about in our John's Bow build, which has actually got three M2 NVMe's, one on the top uh, uh sorry two on the top one on the bottom although though they are great diy nas solutions and components for us to use they're not turnkey you're gonna have to put them together yourself and you've got to source your own software i'm only going to talk about combined hardware and software solutions aka turnkey next thing Honourable mentions, because there is going to be the odd solution in this uh, video that I'm going to reference that aren't part of the best. Now, there's lots of reasons why I might not pick a specific NAS that you think should be on this list. For example, this from Synology, the DS620 Slim. This is a very compact box size solution, and this arrives with six SATA bays that generally people are going to populate with SSDs, two and a half inch SSDs. Why is it not on this list? Well, in the case of this NAS, because not only is it getting harder to find because it's a previous generation, the 2020 series of devices from Synology, but also I'm pretty certain they're going to rock out a new updated version of this with new updated hardware inside. So there isn't much point in me making a recommendation towards a NAS like this that has been out of circulation for a while. Stock and availability is not that great, and it looks like there's going to be an upgrade to this device on the horizon as part of the 2024 series. So that's why. But there's lots of reasons why your solution might not be in this video for reasons of speed, cost or availability. But more on that later on. And next up, how SSDs are supported is going to be very, very important to this. Because technically, NASes that arrive with SSD base are really, really common. They've been around, if you want to go conventional and home user, we've seen things like the DS918 that rocked out in 2017. That was one of the first consumer grade turnkey NAS solutions that had a couple of M2 NVMe bays in the base. And indeed, fast forwarding from that, we've seen um, the utilization of SSDs change quite a lot. Originally, they're only going to be for caching benefits. That's where write caching, where data is being sent to the SSDs, then moved over to the hard drives later on uh, in periods of idle and read caching where more frequently accessed IO data is moved uh, is copied over to the SSDs. Now a lot of users would like to use those SSDs for raw storage, something that Synology has only recently been entertaining for NVMEs, but has been entertaining that and supporting that on SATA drives for quite a while. One step forward from that, you've got brands like QNAP that introduce Q-Tier, which finds a middle ground between t uh, caching and storage balls by creating combined storage areas that have got both mechanical slower hard drives and faster SSDs across both SATA and NVMe, creating a single storage ball that has integrated into it an automatically a cold, warm and hot storage area all in the same storage where data is moved automatically by the system internally. So all of the systems I'm going to talk about today support SSDs at the very least as storage pools. But bear in mind that some brands will allow you to do even more than that depending on which one you go for and the solution that we're going to talk about. Next up, understanding PCI lanes is going to be vital 
because although a lot of the solutions I'm going to talk about today are going to give you insane performance, it's worth highlighting that not all NASes are built the same, and the level of hardware architecture inside will define the bandwidth afforded to the SSDs, and therefore the performance that is possible. Case in point, this is the QNAT TS464, it's about 550 to 600 nicker. It's got four hard drive bays, but it's also got two M2 NVMe bays that are Gen 3. If you look at Gen 3 SSDs in the market right now they're promising like 3000 megabytes per second however if you put them inside this system the M.2 bays are Gen 3 times 1. That PCIe lane there is only going to afford 1000 megabytes per second bandwidth internally for those M.2 SSDs each. So you're not going to be able to exceed that number. Same goes, Synology's DS923 release, you know, comparable in, least in, in as far as what the marketplace is going for at this scale. Their system there that has support earlier on have added on M2 NVMe on there. One of the more, uh, one of the most recent, uh, one of the first releases from Synology to integrate that feature has Gen 3 times one downgraded lanes. There, they've done the same thing and limit the performance of those individual M2 NVMe bays to three times one. The reason being, one, there's only a certain finite number of lanes inside uh, afforded to the CPU and the chipset within a system to integrate all the individual bays, all the individual connections, RAM support, slots, all of that sort of stuff. And even when we look at the more middle ground SSDs we're seeing in prosumer featured solutions for about five to 600 nicker, all of these three solutions here arrive with between eight or nine PCI lanes to play with that need to be afforded throughout the whole system. Therefore, there's only a finite amount of bandwidth that can be handled internally by that CPU. Consequently, they do need to limit a lot of those performance numbers. Um, uh, and also, beyond PCI lanes, there are temperature considerations. Because SSDs get super hot when they get to higher performance numbers. And NASes are going to be on 24-7. And uh, the amount that a drive is working and the amount of write that's happening to it can be detrimental, not only to the overall performance because of throttling by the drive for self-preservation, but also the heat of the system in general. So some NAS brands limit the bandwidth of the SSDs inside the system because of limitations of the chipset or uh, the uh, CPU's lanes, and sometimes they limit those performance numbers for just heat that's being generated throughout the system. And finally, should you worry about durability? This is a big one for a lot of users because when it comes to durability on an SSD, it's always been the big question mark. When you're comparing traditional uh, mechanical hard drives, there's always the feeling that the data on that will last longer because SSDs, are oh, they're really, really good, but they're not as durable. Well, durability comes down more often than not down to um, the SSDs and the quality of the NAND that's being used and the amount of write you know, the degradation on an SSD by read activity is virtually meaningless. It's nothing. But when it comes to write, SSDs generally rock out the gate with something known as TBW or DWPD. Terabytes written or drive writes per day. And unless you are heavy writing to an SSD, the SSD will not wear away until those numbers, or it won't even wear away, but the drives themselves are recommended for constant active use by whatever number the brands say. Generally, drive writes per day will mean how much you can write to the disk per day. So if a drive write per day is 1.0, that means if the drive is one terabyte, this drive can have one terabyte of data freshly written to it every single day for the five year warranty period there. And if we look by this chart here of drive writes per day of some comparable Gen 3 and Gen 4 drives, you're able to see there that those terabytes written in the drive writes per day, you know, they do grow and the higher the drive writes per day and the terabytes written, which is effectively the same thing, but calculated from the other end of the mathematical equation, effectively saying what is the total amount of data that can be written to this annually, you find that unless you intend to effectively recycle the data on that disk repeatedly, something you might do with caching, durability isn't going to be as much of a concern as you think it is, unless, again, you are going to heavy write on the system throughout. Now, we're going to get on to my picks of the best SSD NAS 
but linked in the description will be links to all of the analysis we talk about today, but also these two videos here. One that talks about an idiot's guide to NVMe SSDs, not just in NAS, but outside that we'll talk about everything I've discussed today. But on top of that, there's another guide I've got here based on SSD terminology, where we'll go through every single one of the slangs of SSD um, terminology that will help you understand a good SSD from a bad one and I'm well aware that my hands are still matching that guy on screen. Funny that, but let's crack on with our first pick, an entry level SSD NAS for all. I feel the need, the need for speed. Now this first pick may be a controversial one because technically this isn't a product you can officially buy yet. This is the Link Plus Link Station N1. This is a four NVMe and two SATA SSD system. Now, the reason I bring it up here is even though it is a system that is going to be going on crowdfunding at Indiegogo, it is a realized solution. We've seen it online, we've seen this device at trade shows, we know it is gonna roll out equally. We know Link Plus is an established brand for laptops and hardware peripherals for both home and business users. So this isn't a brand that's come out of nowhere. Now we've already done a full review of this system it rated very well alongside a video review that we did earlier on where we were talking about it alongside some performance numbers of just what this system is capable of. Now there's going to be some of you that are going to want to highlight that this system arrives with uh, true uh, uh, with Unraid on board and therefore it isn't a turnkey solution. It is a turnkey solution because that Unraid license that it arrives with is packed in with it and when you turn it on it boots straight into that straight away. For me, that qualifies as turnkey. Another thing is this is going to be rocking out at $269 to $279, depending on some discount they're gonna be rocking out there. And ultimately, for me, when it comes to an entry level into an SSD NAS solution, I find it really difficult to find better than this, notwithstanding the fact that it is clearly SSD optimized and practically silent when in operation. But on top of that, you have a good leverage there between standard class SATA SSDs up to 12 mil height. So again, 3 TB, some 4 TB drives. But on top of that, you can take advantage of standard big old um, M2 NVMEs inside on the Gen um, 3 slots. They are Gen 3 times 1, but we are still talking about a NAS that rocks around for about two, um, $269 to $279, and will likely, when it hits retail, still be about $299 anyway. So ultimately, when it comes to an entry level into the world of M2 NVMe NAS, with this system most certainly arriving at some point in very early 2024, I would definitely recommend this as a first dipping point into M2 NVMe SSD. Just bear in mind that it is $279 or thereabouts for a good reason. Rocking out with a Celeron, although it has 16 gig of memory, it only has a single 2.5 gig slot there. So it's not perfect, but as an entry level system, I do recommend it. I feel the need, the need for speed. Next up, a NAS that I spoke about on the channel more than a year and a half ago, and I never thought it got the credit it deserved. This is the TBS 464. This is a compact 4-bay M2 NVMe SSD system that supports Gen 3 SSDs, has a couple of 2.5 gigabit Ethernet ports out there, and frankly, I still don't understand what went wrong in terms of its popularity. Indeed, when you go online and you find reviews from Storage Review, from T3, from all of the normal sources for this kind of technology, the reviews were glowing. Indeed, my own review, sorry, self-plug, self-plug, I was really, really pleased with this system. Now, is it perfect? Hell no. For example, the fact it doesn't have 10 GBE, as I said in my video review, wasn't, you know, kind of disappointing. But at the flip side, it is one of the few M2 NVMe systems for home users that you can find where the M2 NVMe bays are Gen 3 times 2. I know that doesn't sound like much, but when you look at practically every single home M2 NVMe or prosumer M2 NVMe SSD system, they're all rocking out with Gen 3 times one slots, which means those SSDs are going to be immediately throttled to 1,000 megabytes per second, but realistically much less, closer to 8 or 900 megabytes per second. That means that these four slots inside here are going to be able to hit 2,000 megs each, which once you factor in array configuration, you're really going to be benefiting there. Also, although it's rocking on a Celeron, you can unofficially install something like TrueNAS or Unraid on this anyway. Now, it isn't 
the cheapest. When I looked online, I looked at the buying options, the best prices I could find was again about $442, but realistically it was more like five to 550 when you factor in the tax. And unlike the link station that I discussed earlier on, this one has active cooling. It has a small, near silent laptop fan inside, but still nonetheless, it means it isn't a silent NAS system. It arrives with a whole ton of heat dissipation and cooling inside. And clearly like you can see from the sizing there, this is not a big system indeed. It's incredibly portable there, hence why a lot of the glowing reviews highlighted that specifically. But when it comes to uh, uh, M2 NVMe SSD system for a working professional that isn't entry level, which gives you a full scope to an established software platform, the TBS 464 is still for me, even at the end of 2023, a fantastic SSD system. I feel the need, the need for speed. Come on, you must have known this was going to be on this video. The Flash Door 6 and the Flash Door 12 Pro are game changers. There I said it. When it comes to a lot of SSD NAS systems out there, whether you are a Synology, a QNAP, an ATOS, or a Terra, whoever it, you back when it comes to your data storage, I think it's inarguable online that these two systems have kind of changed the game. I know that sounds like a big thing, but remember, before we get into the nitty gritty, these are systems that are rocking out at 449 and $799 for the 6 and 12 by M2 NVMe desktop NAS systems. Make sure you factor in your tax in your shipping, of course, but still nonetheless, those are not high price tags. Now, if we look at the 12 bay, because I think the 12 bay is the one that was really kind of surprising, rocking out with that Celeron processor, it's got 12 M2 NVMe bays, and it rocks out with 10 GBE on the rear. Now, again, 10 GBE is still going to be throttling 12 M2 NVMe's worth of performance there, but still nevertheless, even if you go for the 6 bay with a couple of 2.5 Gs, it's the idea you've got that super fast SSD storage inside and you are paying a price tag that arguably I don't think you could build these systems for less than that. To have 12 M2 NVMEs, you'd have to load it onto a PCIe card with the right amount of bandwidth afforded to it. Now, I wasn't the only one to say that. That was said on Linus Tech Tips there. Not only my own review, he said arrogantly, but it, there are so many reviews online where they talked about just how ass-kicking this system is. Now, unsurprisingly, just like I mentioned earlier on, there's going to be limitations. Those lanes are Gen 3 times 1 downgraded each. Um, Asus Store themselves ran some fantastic cooling tests online. Sorry, I had to break in recording there just to get the video up because I was that impressed with it. Asus Store themselves called me out on my comments in my review when I was talking about being slightly concerned about those SSDs not really having a lot of cooling. And they actually went to the trouble of showing a lot of their facilities where they had the system running extensively to show that on 3 times one lanes, the heat being generated wasn't too aggressive so again i just wanted to give them the shout out for that because definitely they proved a lot of con uh, you know detractors myself included wrong to a certain extent there now again we've done the full review on this and the testing and overall as you can see from the scoring it's the highest rate one of the ssd nazis we're talking about so far deservedly and even though it's running on a seller and even though the external bandwidth can't be upgraded although you can add usb upgrades there uh, the flash door 6 and indeed the 12 pro are some of the best middle ground kind of home prosumer and business accessible solutions out there in the market for dedicated M2 NVMe SSD storage. And remember, let's circle back, $449 and $799. There is a good reason that this NAS is going to appear in a lot of my best of the year videos. And ultimately, as far as all the NASs of this year go, this has been a real heavy hitter to talk about. I feel the need, the need for speed. Now, if you thought me including uh, the Indiegogo NAS at the start of this video was a little bit left field, we're going to talk about another QNAP. This is the TBS 574TX. The reason I keep looking at the screen is they've changed the name of this product three times in development. First revealed at the start of the year in CES 2023, it was known as the TBS 574X. Then later in the year, when it got to mid-range about Computex, where we covered it on the channel, they included Thunderbolt 4 connectivity on this dedicated M2 NVMe system. Since then, they are now talking about the name being changed to the TBS 
H574TX. Seriously, QNAP, do you want to give me a migraine? But on top of that, the system not only rocking out with Thunderbolt 4 and Intel Core 12th Gen um, uh, CPU inside, it also arrived with ES1 SSD bays. What does that mean? Well, that means M2 NVMEs with hot swapping. That is one of the biggest downfalls of M2 NVMe. It is the idea that if you do have a file drive, you've got to power down the system. Also, M2 NVMe's, they capacity-wise, you will traditionally be capped at 4 TB, although we have seen 8 TB drives rocking out, but those 8 TBs from brands like Subrent, and we talked about the AdLink one on Gen 4 recently, number one, those SSDs have a tendency to be more than 2280 in length, or they end up getting very, very warm, and by warm I mean super hot. And also on top of that, the pricing, because of the amount of NAND, uh, the density of that NAND is through the roof. Now, the um, TBS 574TX there, and stick an H in it if you want, uh, this has got five bays of storage there, but because of it using the ES1 architecture there, it means that you are able to not only get more space for each of those SSDs as well as heat sinks, but on top of that, those SSDs can be denser for the ventilation running through the system at all times. Now, we covered this uh, during Computex there. We got really up close to this device. It was one of the standout devices during the whole of the trade show there with these dedicated ES1 adapters there allowing um, uh, the installation of these drives and hot swapping in utilization. You're going to see more of this later on. And I know I keep saying ES1 when it's E1S and I will keep getting that mixed up. I'm well aware of it. Save yourself putting that in the comments. But it really left a substantial mark on the community of people that saw this as a bit of a game-changing solution there. And when we saw it being covered online, although the fact it is a Thunderbolt equipped NAS allowing you to point to point connect it with a thunderbolt 4 nas system using uh, ip over thunderbolt uh, plug and play technology it is still an absolute game changer of a compact system that is allowing users to take advantage of some of the leveraging performance benefits of m2 ssds but also access them in a more convenient way it's got 10 gbe and 2.5 gig fine but having thunderbolt 4 and that intel core i3 or i5 processor is really really impressive although early report to this i've seen while talking with qnap have seemingly indicated that those m2 nvme bays are limited to gen 3 times 2 which is a real shame but nonetheless that is still 2000 megabytes per second afforded to each of those bays hold out for this one it is definitely coming and i think it's going to arrive if not by the end of 2023 then at the start of 2024 i feel the need the need for speed now, earlier on in this video, I highlighted a Synology NAS that was part of an older series of devices, and I said that I would probably see an upgrade. Now, the system we're looking at here, the FS6400, is potentially susceptible to the same thing. We've seen sub-revisions of these devices rocking out from Synology with uh, a 10 prefix there on the end, and maybe there will be an upgrade to this as Synology from what I can see, start to roll out better high-density storage devices from their catalogue and they're upgrading their storage, almost certainly rolling out, if not an e, um, a U.2 drive then very soon, then definitely some higher performance SAS-based SSDs. Now, we'll get on to why that's important later on, but this device, which arrived on the seat quite a long time ago now, is a fully-fledged 24-bay, um, 2.5-inch SATA and SAS SSD server for business there. Now, obviously, a big part of this system's appeal is going to be Synology's DSM platform, and it better be appealing because this is a ten dollars to $11,000 box here. That is a lot of the old Wongo being slapped down. This is very much the pinnacle flash system there again running on an intel silver but there are talks uh when as we're seeing synology move over to epyc um, we're almost certainly if not already going to see an amd variant of this device eight core 16 thread and again with the memory there going up to half a terabyte of storage these 24 bays and it is hugely expandable support both sata and sas ssds inside now one of the complications and one of the reasons I'm introducing this into the video is still a hot pick for Enterprise, even though it is an older box, because again, we look at the review dates, this device was, you know, reviewed in what, 2019, 2020? Um, 
One of the reasons I bring it up is a lot of uh, more recent release solutions from Synology have started limiting the compatibility of third-party drives inside. Now, the newer generations have started to show that, but some of the older ones do not. Now, this is really important when you're looking at a system like this where it supports SAS drives, because we saw this in some of the newer generation SA series from Synology where they limited compatibility or at least supported compatibility on the main pages from the brand when it came to using third-party drives. Now, the flash station doesn't seem to have that limitation, and it means that although Synology themselves have got some you know, reasonably and highly durable um, SATA-based SSDs in the SAT 5200 and 5210 series, you're going to go for a system like this and spend that kind of money because you want to use SAS SSDs. These open the door to 12 gig and dual 12 gig performance numbers of between 1 and 3,000 megabytes per second. And this device is no exception because alongside the support of, again, the standard people, you know, your WDs, your Kingstons, uh, your Seagate, Inside there, some of these drives are listed as compatible because of that SAS SSD connectivity at 2.5 inch. You can take advantage of some of the Nitro series, for example. You could take advantage of some of the Ultrastar SSDs out there. And if you went for a more modern Synology solution at the enterprise level, so for example, if we go for some of their uh, rack mount servers here on screen, what you'll see on the flash storage solutions there, if we go for, say, the 10, the 3410 series, where they've upgraded some of those hardware specifications, you start to see the compatibility start to become just a wee bit more limited. And once we look at some of the SA series, which again, bear in mind, although it's a three and a half inch system, you can still use um, two, and a half, uh, two and a half inch SSD systems. The compatibility on a lot of these systems becomes significantly different. So for example, as we look at this page here for the hard drive compatibility as it loads in, you'll see on the hard drives and SSDs, there is no option there for swapping between first and third party drives, as we could see when it came to looking at the FS system there. Um, so do bear that in mind. And that's one of the reasons why for enterprise users, I still highly recommend this box. It has huge horsepower underneath the bonnet. It already arrives out the gate with some great uh, network connection straight away, but also the upgradability across multiple PCIe upgrade slots. And of course, of course, of course, the inclusion of DSM on this system cannot be overstated. It is still for me, the gold standard. Is it cheap? Sod no, it's really expensive, but you are getting a complete enterprise level solution at rack mount. But what about you desktop users? I feel the need, the need for speed. Now for desktop users, this NAS for me just absolutely wipes the floor with practically anything else out there. And it kind of, as you would expect from Kino, it's the third placement on this list, which is insane. For all of the solutions I talk about in terms of SSD storage, none of them, apart from this one, have addressed a big change in SSD architecture in the last 24 to even 36 months. And that is when SSDs went from Gen 3 to Gen 4 and moving towards Gen 5 very gradually right now. This is the only system on this list that supports Gen 4 SSDs, which doubles the bandwidth, doubles the performance, and a lot of Gen 4 SSDs in the market are insane in their performance. If you look at uh, even ones from, say, Samsung, WD, Seagate, they are drives that crank out at sequential read speeds of well in excess of 7,000 megabytes per second and sequential um, uh, write performance there of, you know, six, six and a half thousand megabytes per second there. This is an SSD that is actually able to harness those performance numbers. Now, again, we're going to cut to the chase. It's not cheap. It's still half of the Synology, though. And yes, this is a 12 bay, and that was a 24 bay, and that was a rank man, and this is a desktop, and if candy and nuts, etc. But that's still a lot of money. Now, this is a system arriving with U.2 Gen 4 support. It rocks out the gate with 25 gigabit Ethernet, not 2.5. There isn't some hidden decimal, decimal place there. It's 25 GBE. That's 2,000 megabytes per second per port, and there's two of them on there. But it doesn't stop there. Notwithstanding, it rocks out with different configurations of CPU of EPYC processor, which, by the way, gets seriously hench as you move up the architecture. Again, totaling, if you wish, to upgrade up to one terabyte of memory, which is insanity, but also pretty much 
in essential when you're talking about SSD performance there. Although why it's not ECC memory directly really surprises me. Um, although it is hard dim, of course. Um, but on top of that, those U.2 Gen 4 slots are times 4 each. They are Gen 4 times 4. That is 8,000 megabytes per second of bandwidth. And thanks to Gen 4 SSD uh, converters that allow you to use M.2 NVMEs into U.2 enclosures, it means that you can seriously take advantage of not only the full bandwidth afforded to these SSDs internally, but also thanks to the support of those two 25 gigabit Ethernet ports, you've got a decent amount of external throughput. Still, the external bandwidth is still going to throttle the potential internal performance of those SSDs, but also, luckily, we've got four Gen 4 PCIe upgrade slots there. That is insanity. Those PCIe Gen 4 slots can be occupied by QNAP's own card here from the QM2 series. Particular standouts are ones like this one, which is a 2x Gen 4 M2 NVMe card that also has two 10 gig ports bolted onto it. You can even get dedicated Gen 4 SSD storage upgrade cards to add four more of those M2 NVMe slots inside. And again, full bandwidth afforded to them there this is a hugely performance ready system and although the gen uh, 4 lanes that are afforded to it are still not gen 5 qnap does have a gen 5 amd rank mount system in development but again i think we're not going to see that until well into 2024 now again the ssds that you can utilize inside this whether it is you're going to be utilizing gen 2 um sorry uh, u.2 ssds that can go inside those bays or using some of the adapters are all going to add up to a system that not only is going to be able to leverage a decent amount of capacity thanks to all of those bays and U.2 drives allowing you more capacity, but also huge potential for internal performance and external performance. And given it's half the price of the Synology we were talking about, which again is rocking out on just SAS SSDs rather than leveraging Gen 4 SSD performance, for half the price you are getting a huge upgrade in terms of performance there. We did our own review here and we did some performance testing with multiple vms all running within the system indeed there are review very few reviews online i will add largely because this is such a rare system and technically qnap every time they list it it sells out very very quickly whenever you look online but still nonetheless if you are an enterprise business user and you're looking for a desktop high performance effective hyperscale uh, performance device for ssd storage this is definitely the one for you but this has been the best ssd nas for you to buy at the end of 2023 and almost certainly into 2024 i hope you found this video helpful we covered a lot of information in today's video and again if you need further assistance use the free advice section over on nas compares if you're still on the fence about what kind of system you use we're still developing the nas builder tool that will allow you to filter through and basically handpick a nas based on its credentials and compatible um, elements based on what you need it to do and allow you to put it together and get the right solution for you. The same goes if you're looking for the right storage, you can find the NAS high drive finder, the RAID calculator, and all of these are unique tools. You can't find them elsewhere. But other than that, thank you so much for watching. I hope you've enjoyed the video. Link to a guide in the description where we go through all of our results and a few more honorable mentions. But apart from that, I will see you next time.